Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting episode of The Daily Friend Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Larimer, and I'm joined today by the wise and venerable Terence Corrigan. Terence, how are you? <laughs> well, thanks, Nicholas, and yourself. I'm very well, thank you. And our uh, chief investigative journalist, uh, the tall man with the beard, Mr. Gabriel Krauser, who is back from his sojourn in uh, Mpumalanga and going to tell us all about what happened to him. Gabriel, how are you? I'm good. Uh, how's it to both of you? And a, a, an apology to our listeners. I am currently sort of in Santon, in central Santon. And so if you hear a bit of construction or car sounds in the background, uh, my apologies for that. We are currently having the IRR car repaired next door at the, at the, at the repair shop. And it's taken a day longer than they said right. it would. But uh, I'm, I and can't of course, go without the car. I believe part of the reason that it is being repaired is because someone threw a rock at you, as we discussed on the Tuesday show. <laughs> yes, yes, that is. Uh, it is not for any other reason that the car needs to be repaired. Indeed. Um, so let's get straight into it then. Tell us what happened. You were there in Petrotif um, Mokondo to investigate what? A, a, a case about I'm shooting a farm workers? Yes. So there's a double murder trial, uh, murder, kidnapping, assault, and the two deceased are the Tolka brothers, uh, Amos and Senzele, although Amos is otherwise known as Nkribi, uh, I think. Um, the, the allegation coming from four witnesses quoted, summarized by the state uh, in the bail hearings on Tuesday was that seven people had arrived on Pampun Kral Farm outside Petrotif, otherwise known as Mkondo, and they'd come to seek work that uh, one of them was assaulted, uh, Mr. Shashwayo, and then tied to a tree, whereupon the other six left and called in for support. Uh, when that support came, it included uh, the Koka brothers, and uh, uh, at the same time, the farm owners, farm workers, and indunas uh, called in their support group, and uh, then the two groups were sort of stuck on either side of a road, in a sense stuck on side of either side of the fence, where the work seekers and their families and friends had come to try and liberate Mr. Tlatswayo, who had been held hostage and uh, were told to go away. And when they didn't, uh, two of them were shot dead. The version of the accused, uh, five accused, uh, four farmers and a farm manager, is that they... Uh, is that at Pampun Kral, uh, uh, people had arrived in the morning, were harassing farm workers, uh, uh, telling them to call the farm manager or farm owner. Mr. Potkita arrived, and uh, the farm owner, and he was then uh, st struck with a blow to the head by a nobkiri, uh, whereupon the farm workers then detained Mr. Tlatswayo uh, for this attack and called the police. And it is uh, confirmed by the police that they were phoned at this time, around 11 in the morning, and that they were holding Mr. Tlatswayo while they waited for the police to come. But the police didn't come. By an hour or so later, the, a, a group, a larger group had arrived, including the Tolka brothers, and they uh, were, were wanting to get Mr. Tlatswayo released and, and, and uh, were angry with the farmers. Mr. Potkiter, in the meanwhile, I think, was taken to hospital. I'm not sure if he was taken right then or later. Uh, certainly, he was taken to hospital where he remained for quite some time for, for his severe uh, head injury. Um, and then, as things heated up, uh, one of the Tolka brothers uh, struck a blow to one of the farmers, Hans Mulman's head, with a steel pipe, which knocked him out. And uh, Mr. Mulman has been in hospital uh, in a condition that renders him incapable of speaking. Um, so I'm not sure how severe it is. I'm not sure if he's in a coma or not, but he's been in a very serious condition for the last 10 days. And uh, he was armed uh, upon being struck to the ground. Uh, the Tolka brother was able to take his gun and then run back to, to try and get to the safety of the bucky that he had and get in or behind that bucky in order to shoot 
the farmers from behind the bucky so that he would be protected from being shot back at. Uh, but he was shooting while he was running and so accidentally uh, struck his own brother who then died. So that's how the one Koka brother died and then himself was shot uh, allegedly by um, Otart Klinger in, in self-defense uh, while he was being shot at. So those are the two versions and, right. uh, and they're completely different versions. from each other really. I mean, in, in some of the key facts there. They are day and night. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I went to the, the to the court to hear those versions play out and in particular to hear the, the, the versions of the accused are, are in the bail hearing, they, they, they are not cross-examined. They don't go into the witness stand and face cross-examination. Basically, the affidavits are read into the record. And the state, however, does have to produce, well, the state produced uh, their investigating officer, uh, warrant officer David Mukile, and he is cross-examined. Uh, because w one of the arguments that the defense can make is that if the state's case is weak, then you should release the accused on bail. You can still go forward with the case if the state prefers to do so, if it thinks later evidence will surface, but a bail application is an urgent application if the state's case is at the moment weak, then that's a reason for them to get bail. Other reasons that they gave is that they're not a flight risk, that's common cause, that they're trying to harvest their soya, for example, right now, uh, a lot of farm owners involved, four of them, without them and the farm manager operations stall, uh, which could render the year's crop uh, either less profitable, not profitable or at all, or, 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 or a dead loss. Um, other such concerns are raised, of course, in the bail hearing. But the state's, the strength or weakness of the state's case, I think, was the most interesting from a public perspective uh, in that cross-examination. And it was a very, it was, it was a, it was a difficult thing to sit and watch. Uh, the gallery uh, was occupied by a, a, a self proclaimed EFF member of parliament. I didn't manage to get his name. Uh, there were uh, some people with ANC paraphernalia, uh, three ANC leaders there. And uh, during the break before the uh, warrant officer came to testify for the state, they were taking photographs of the accused and of the courtroom the court official came in to say, you can't do that. Permission's only been given for the media to do that. You're not media representatives. On the list, everyone has to give a justification for why they're coming to court. And your justification has been that you're community leaders. Uh, and so the court has given specific instructions about who is and who isn't allowed to take photographs. They uh, then shouted at her and told her not to speak to them as children. Um, that was one of the first sort of heated exchanges. There was another heated exchange outside uh, to do with a separate rape case where there was some toy toying in the sort of courthouse. Of course, outside of the court, there was flashbangs and rocks being thrown and, and bricks being thrown and loudspeakers blaring speeches and music the whole day through. So it was a bustling and exciting environment to try and soberly assess the, the, the merits of the case. Um, the, the, the final sort of theatrical... Um, frame of reference that I think people should be aware of is that in the course of the warrant officer giving his testimony, I noticed that he was, uh, someone was drawing attention to himself uh, by clicking his pen against his forehead and then holding up a board with paper on it that he'd written messages on to show to the warrant officer while he was testifying across the courtroom. And this person was sort of seated behind the podium of the state's attorney, of the state's counsel, sorry, an advocate, uh, and so was out of the view of the magistrate, uh, Magistrate Van Cormo. So he couldn't be seen by the magistrate, and he couldn't really be seen by the defense because he's sort of to the little bit behind the defense and the other way from the witness, but he could be seen by the gallery, by, by people like me. I was the only media guy at the time still there. And I assumed that you're allowed to do this because he kept doing it and writing more messages and holding them up for the investigating officer to see while he's giving his testimony what to say. When the defense finally noticed this an hour later, they drew attention to the court that this is taking place. And uh, suddenly the papers were concealed and the, and, the, and the board was put flat and they said, no, 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 this is just notes. 
And then they said, no, we definitely saw this. If you want to deny that this happened, uh, you know, you're going to make this an even more serious matter. Then they said, no, no, no. We, we're trying to help the investigating officer out. This guy should be seated next to him. Then they all started speaking Latin and I couldn't really understand, but I did uh, court terminology. <laughs> um, but I did speak to a legal expert who said that, that this is extremely worrying and that in the usual course of things, you, you would throw a witness's testimony out if it was being tampered with literally while he's sitting in the box. Um, the defense said that they were flabbergasted at the behavior an adjournment was called. And when we came back, it was it, that that stopped. So that was a sort of kind of theatrical fandango, which which gave so, one the sense that the rules that, that that things were irregular. Right. So I have two questions um, b b before we go to, to Terence's take on this. Um, and before we, before you finish up, one, do we know who the person who was giving the notes was? Uh, He's a police officer. Okay, he's a police officer. And the second question is, any idea what was being written on those notes uh, specifically? I, I, tr I tried to see. I couldn't make out the words themselves because I, when he was writing them, I'd sort of have to look at a funny angle. And when he turned them up straight, it was facing away from me. Okay, so that's very worrying behavior by the police. Um, anything you want to add before I, before I ask Terence's view? Yeah, so I, I just want to add that that uh, the 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 what the investigating officer said was extremely worrying. He summarized the state's case as I've just described it about these four innocent and unarmed work seekers being viciously murdered. Sorry, these seven people going, one being detained, then them getting more people, uh, and then and then two being viciously murdered. Uh, this this uh, th this was hard to hear. I mean, it's a devastating account. If that's what happened, it's it's uh, it's it's heinous cruel and unusual crime. Uh, the defense challenged it by uh, asking the state whether any of these witnesses could explain how Mr. Potgieter or Mr. Mulman or one of the other farmers who were seriously injured were injured. These witnesses were there and there were these two groups and they were antagonistic. Uh, how did the one group get injured? There was no explanation of that. Um, the, the second uh, thing that they challenged uh, them on is uh, why did these witnesses not call the police to get assistance in helping out with the liberation of Mr. Slachwayo if they believed that he was innocently being detained, uh, illegally being detained, uh, given that the police are about five, ten minutes away and the, and the families that had to come had to come from further and there was no explanation of that either. Th those were the two chief challenges, uh, name, namely that the story might be inconsistent in itself and that the story doesn't take into account material and objective uncontested facts, namely that three of the farmers were injured. And by the way, all of the witnesses and the accused agree that after the shots were fired, there was no more violence. Things cooled down and everyone stayed put basically for 20 minutes until the police finally did arrive. This is about two hours after they were initially called, um, but 20 minutes after the shots were fired. So those injuries couldn't have been sustained after the shots. If they had been sustained before the shots, it would undermine the state's case and serve the accused case that the shootings took place in self-defense. Interesting. So there's a, a hell of a lot of detail in that story, I think, that uh, that is a bit going to be difficult to unpack in the time that we have. But Terence, it seems like there's a number of issues here. And one of them is that um, there was a something like a, a, a labor dispute in the sense that there was pressure because of unemployment and that appears to have led to a confrontation of some kind which both stories both versions seem to agree on um and then what followed from there was escalation and the other thing of course is that throughout the police are unreliable or absent um not showing up to mediate things and prevent things from getting out of control what's your thoughts yeah look that uh, uh that's 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 the kernel here, I think, from a public policy perspective, that 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 the state agency is meant to um, meant to mediate this sort of thing just don't function properly. You know, you talk, you, Gabriel mentioned a, a two hour wait. You know, this is where you people have been seriously injured. It's not um, that that that's a, a very worrying state of affairs. Um, you know. Something that 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 has been kind of suggested that this this may have something to do with a um, uh, with a with a sort of work seeker scam. Uh, people are encouraged to go to this farm because supposedly there's 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 work there, and supposedly they, they uh, you know funds have been made available. 
um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, um, I don't have a, a sort of full, uh, a, a full facts, but that, that was, um, uh, that idea was, was, uh, was put to me. Apparently it's been happening. It's been happening more and more on farms. Um, and I think some, some urban businesses as well. The it's, it's, it's vaguely known to a lot of people that the government has given money for COVID and, uh, you know, your your leader or broker or whatever will come and say, well, you know, this this business has got five million rand, so you're entitled to go there and get a job. Um, is it is it possible that 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 something like this could have um, uh, could have could have been at play? Um, but you know, obviously, we have to we have to wait and see what the uh, uh, what 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 emerges in court. As Gabriel says, it's a it seems to be a very complicated situation. Um, unfortunately, I think this, uh, this has also been uh, been hijacked by various uh, by, by various vested interests who are uh, invested in getting um, in getting people angry and, uh, and 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 driving particular narratives. Um, I've been quite disappointed uh, with some of the with some of the reporting that I've seen in, in, in much of the media, which seems to also be committed to a um, uh, to a sort of good versus evil um, uh, 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 evil por um, uh, a, a portrait, and I think you know what what Gabriel said about the about the conduct of the um, uh, of, of of the police officers in the court is mind blowing, mind blowing, and I you know I think that that uh, you know irrespective of the facts or the outcome of this case, that is something that should have got a great deal more um, uh, more attention. Right. Um, so there's one more thing that I think we definitely need to cover before we move on. And that is, of course, the very nasty uh, racial edge that this whole thing has taken on. So, of course, in the uh, one version of the story, this is essentially a labor dispute that escalates out of control. And in the other version of the story, this is a brutal killing of unarmed black men by white farmers. Um, and in and, and that version and, seems to and, be the and, one. A, and a black farm worker. Who right, is, and, and who's right. mentally corrupt or something. Right, right. Um, so the, the idea here is that uh, there needs to be proper justice and vengeance, and that seems to be what the ANC is pushing. And I presume that has that led in part to the attack on you, Gabriel, um, is that the ANC and the EFF are encouraging basically people saying, look, the, the whites are killing us, that kind of thing. Uh, you need to go out and commit violence. Um, can you talk a little bit about this racial aspect thing that's going on? How much of it is manufactured? Is it like widespread? What what's what's the story here? Yeah, I mean, I must say, to its credit, both ANC and EFF leaders who were speaking through the microphone at times called for peace and to calm down and to collaborate with the police. Also, at times, they uh, sang uh, warlike songs um, and and made very aggressive comments about white people, about farmers, uh, very antagonistic uh, in that regard. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's like push-pull, push-pull. The, the, the racial edge is clear. The police themselves, the warrant officer who testified said, one of the reasons you should deny these people bail is that if you let them out, there will be even more anti-white violence. We've already had reports of anti-white violence and there will be more if you let them out because the people believe the warrant officer said i've been going up and down everywhere investigating it and everyone i speak to says no th th there's a problem with white people here you can't let these ones out you must put more white people in jail um and he said that there should that there are more arrests to be expected and that if you let these guys out there'll be more anti-white violence so so that's that's coming from the investigating officer the chief investigating officer in this case uh that's definitely also my experience uh when i was attacked i was the words umlungu were being yelled at me uh, together with other phrases, um, all of the victims of car attacks that I'm aware of were white. Um, in, in the story that I filed, I mentioned four cases where people were had their cars bashed in. I've had reports from a business uh, colleague of someone, of a fifth person whose car was bashed in uh, in the same area on the same day, uh, who actually... They managed to throw enough rocks through that they smashed the window and then got another rock through that struck him a blow to the head uh, and he managed to get away uh, but later i think lost consciousness and had to be hospitalized um so it was very serious also a man was was stabbed uh in the total garage uh, where i was attacked and that person is uh according to the police still in hospital i don't know the race of that person i and and and, and i think it's important to say that once you're outside of your car 
you're not just identified by your looks, you are also easily identified by what you're saying or what you're not saying. And if someone is not going along with the narrative, black or white, they can be challenged. Um, and and this, this, is, this was made clear in court and outside of court. It was also made clear at the funeral, which I attended, uh, of the Tolka brothers, which was an elaborate affair sponsored by the municipality, uh, huge gazebos, municipal trucks going uh, up and down uh, many kilometers of dirt road to splash water so that there wouldn't be dust, porta potties, food for everyone, and so on. Very beautiful coffins, very beautiful speeches, some of them especially coming from the religious leaders, especially coming from the traditional leaders. But some of the political leaders that spoke said that if you're a black person and you work for white farmers, you are impimpi. You are a spy of the apartheid regime, and uh, this is something that the traditional leaders especially expressed to me is, is a message that they desperately want to put away. Um, but it is, it is, it's part of the narrative. It's part of the, po the politics on the scene in Petrutif. Interesting. So that's quite interesting that the traditional leaders are not on side here with the, uh, with the, with the, with the politicians. Um, which which I think is a, is, a, is a good thing for the stability of that community, but very worrying stuff indeed. Um, I worry for their and, safety, yes. Yeah, no, definitely. That I, I suspect this is not the end of, of potential violence there. Especially um, not just to put a final point on it. The bail mm. hearing is not concluded. Uh, the state uh, council had other appointments, so it'll have to come back next week. And... Um, yeah, I mean, whether it's speaking to the, the court security who don't have guns or to uh, sort of low-level workers at petrol stations and at funeral parlors and uh, and the like, they're, they're terrified of what will happen if bail is granted um, right. because uh, they, they think, uh, you know, to use an American phrase, you ain't seen nothing yet. Indeed. Um, so as you mentioned, Terence, I think one of the worst aspects of this has been how incredibly poorly the story has been covered by most of the media. Um, I believe that only the the uh, the state's case was basically reported in the media. The defense was given almost no detail at all. Um, and, and Gabriel can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong on that. But uh, and also the details of the case, the the, the racial language, the violence uh, against ordinary white white people there, the police's activities in the court. Apart from the Daily Friend, I don't think anyone has reported that. Uh, what's your thoughts, Terence? I think I think you're quite right, and I think that the, that this is uh, this is a situation where, at the very least, you need um, uh, you need nuance. Um, I think uh, a nuance in itself challenges uh, challenges dogmatic uh, uh, narratives. And while there may be some in um, in the journalistic community who um, are simply you know working off very limited information that's being transmitted out, anybody who's um, uh, who's been there, I think, should should make a point of trying to of of trying to understand the different perspectives. Um, you know, I think that 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 could simply be a matter of professional responsibility and it's concerning if it's not being done. Certainly my, um, uh, my experience and my experience may well be incomplete is that um, there is a very, uh, there, there is a very simplistic uh, uh, one-sided and uh, very charged narrative being, uh, being created and put forward. Definitely. If I can f follow up on that, Nick, sorry, sure, I know sure. we're running on time here. Um, in the Afrikaans media, that hasn't been the case. Rapport, um, the cover page of its weekly issue on Sunday, um, was on on the on this case, and they did present both sides, and they did present nuance. Um, I would further add that it's uh, there, there. There are some local radio stations and and papers that have been trying. I think I think it's on the national news that we've really been seeing this one-sided thing, right. and so yeah, as so not to. It's as a so national not to make English this... language uh, paper, uh, yes. papers and, and websites and stuff. Okay, yeah, no, I think that's and, a very important TV. distinction. Yeah, And, and, and so as not to fall, fall prey to the same mistake, you know, I should say one of the reasons that people in the area are so charged against Pampun Kral farmers is the allegation that last year or that recently um, several cows belonging to members who were involved with this group with this incident, uh, that a number of cows had been poisoned to death. And um, it does seem plausible on the face of it 
the the the, the story is that uh, you know on the there's there's people in the homesteads you might call them labor tenants, uh, although not in the legal sense, who are running cattle and. And there's disagreement between the farmers and them about what the carrying capacity of the land is and so what they're allowed. And it is the landowner's duty by law to enforce the laws on not exceeding carrying capacity of the land. Um, now, the proper way to do this is usually to, to uh, get an order from the sheriff to impound the cattle. Uh, this can take years. Uh, but it, but the allegation is that uh, th that was circumvented. The law was taken into their hands and, and some of the ca cows were poisoned. Um, there's also... Uh, it is a fact that in August last year, two people died uh, in the vicinity of this farm that was covered by special assignment. Again, in a one-sided fashion, they didn't manage to get a story out of the farmers, although they, they tried. Um, that case is not even pending. There's, there's no open uh, investigation. There's no open allegation from the state side that, they, that the farmers were responsible for those murders, which suggests to me that there isn't good evidence to support this allegation. But it is right. widely believed by the community that both the okay. cows were killed and that there were previous deaths that the farmers were responsible for. So, 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 so that would uh, suggest why this escalated so quickly and in such a violent way, is that there's already this underlying narrative about how these particular guys are bad, bad hombres, to use a line from President Trump. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's yeah. complicated, and that all needs to be looked further into, and that is what we're doing. Exactly. And and I think... I think um, so actually, we, I think we, I think we won't do another topic today because we are we are running a bit late now. But um, that for me is is once again the key here is we've got very different stories, we've got conflicting evidence, we've got a complicated case that needs to be unpacked and thought through in a rational and sober way. And so what we don't need are politicians there with racial invective and agitation what we don't need is police who appear to not be doing their job i mean as you say those previous murders there's no case open for them so of course people are just going to believe crazy things if there's literally no sort of investigation going on to them the police not showing up on time the police not de-escalating the situation and from the sounds of it the police acting poorly in the courtroom which is yet another level above in terms of, of and of the display. police acting poorly i mean sorry to jump in here in, in your case as well. told me to go where i went where i was attacked yes. with those rocks thrown at the car i was following the police's instructions of where yes, to go no, exactly and so exactly. and so, and i was following it very directly they said go to the total garage everyone else was also following it indirectly in the sense that the police had put out the route that you're supposed to go you're not supposed to go here you're supposed to go there and the police were great the first half of the day on monday was was uh was hectic i mean there were thousands of protesters and there were lots of rocks being thrown and 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 i didn't see anyone there was none of this like shooting uh, rubber bullets into someone's face two meters away uh the right. police were disciplined and and they followed procedure for the first half of the day and then by two o'clock the police for the most part melted away but the protesters were still there and the protesters retreated from the barbed wire fence in large part four blocks down to the total garage and that wasn't addressed even when a man had been stabbed the police didn't go to then secure the area when rocks were being thrown through cars i mean that took place at least for an hour maybe an hour and a half maybe two people were still coming into the police station suffering this and no one thought to go out and investigate the matter it was it was kind of tacitly accepted by everyone that the point of going to the police station to report this crime is to get a case number so that the insurance company will uh, reimburse you for right. the damage not yeah. so that the police can go and stop this thing from continuing to happen which is yep. absurd right but this is what this version is even more worrying because as you say the police were capable of acting correctly in the first half of the day and then just stopped anyway uh, any any final thoughts, Terence, before we, we wrap up in the last uh, 20 seconds or so? Yeah. No, uh, but, you know, I, I really do wish that uh, that that, that uh, those of the influence would, ste uh, would step back and think very carefully about the consequences of uh, inflaming situations which are fraught with potential for inflammation. Um, Indeed. Nothing good, nothing good at all can come out of this. If an injustice has been done in a constitutional democracy, let that be let that be punished through the um uh, through the appropriate channels right and indeed if the state's case turns out to be more or less accurate 
all of the actions by protesters and politicians here, I think, have done nothing but undermine the the the, the, the yes. thoroughness and goodness of that case. So it's in everyone's interest to step back from this. Anyway, that is all the time we have for today. I hope uh, that you found the show interesting and enlightening. Um, thank you, Gabriel, for, for coming on today. It was uh, good to hear from the horse's mouth, so to speak, what exactly is going on uh, in, in the, 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 on the edges of South Africa. And yeah, we'll, we'll see you next week. Tonight, we've got a live stream with me and Terence and Gabriel again, uh, where we're going to be talking about expropriation and who fits the bill for it. Um, but you'll find out more about that tonight at seven. Anyway, thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you.